الحمد لله وكفى والصلاه والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam we welcome you today from a place called kinrara is that how it's pronounced kinrara in kuala lumpur in malaysia where our son uh, faris has opened a uh, car wash place maybe that's why we have so much rain today <laughs> and uh, today's function is to inaugurate his new business and he's asked us to come to look at the subject of business ethics in islam Ethics is that branch of knowledge in Arabic al-akhlaq al-akhlaq Ethics is that branch of knowledge which determines what is good and what is evil what is virtuous what is vice hmm? uh, <coughs> what is morally commendable and morally we disapprove of and it is from ethics that we derive our law what is halal and what is haram you cannot have law without first having ethics or morality and uh, we are now looking at ethics as it applies to business and business transactions and uh, the first thing we'll do is to look at the hadith of the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam um, in which he said pay the laborer his wage before the sweat on his forehead dries up do not delay in paying a laborer his wage after he has completed his work indicating from this command that if we were to delay in paying a man his wage and keep him waiting and he has to knock from pillar to post to try to get the money for which he has already worked that this is something which the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam disapproves of this is ethically or morally wrong in fact if a man has done the job and you do not pay him his wage but keep him waiting for it you are oppressing him and the one thing that is so remarkable about the religion of islam which is of course the religion of ibrahim alayhi salam is the religion that came to ibrahim alayhi salam the prophet abraham and therefore the christians know about this and the jews know about this is the same religion which came to Moses Musa alayhi salam and so the Christians knew about it and the Jews knew about it and it's the same religion which came to Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam what is remarkable about this one true religion is that it has zero tolerance for oppression zero tolerance for oppression and so we must be careful not to oppress people not to oppress a laborer 
but to pay the wage as soon as the job is finished. But now we come to the wage that is paid. How do we pay a wage? <laughs> we have to pay a wage in money. That's how we pay a wage, in money. And uh, what money do we use? If we use a money in which the value of the money is constantly diminishing, money is constantly losing value, then the wage that that man gets for his labor, that wage would not store the value of his labor. For example, he worked for the whole month and we now have to pay him his wage at the end of the month. The wage that he gets can buy five sheep. But when he gets this wage from you, you pay him in a money which is constantly losing value, like the US dollar, which is the key, they call it currency. The key currency in the world today is called the US dollar. In, 19, in the 1920s, 20 US dollars had the value of one ounce of gold. And by 1944, it took 35 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And then by 1971 to 73, it took 40 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And then in October 73, it took 160 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And then in January 1980, it took 850 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And today, it takes more than 1700 US dollars to buy the same one ounce of gold. So if that man had stored his wage in US dollars, then after a while it could no longer buy five sheep. It could buy only four, and then three, and then two, and then one, and then finally you can't even buy a sheep. That's not fair. In the Quran Allah has repeated a command three times. He says, Walatab Khasunna Sa Ashia Ahum. Do not diminish the value of people's things, people's properties, people's wealth, people's wages. The money which we are now using around the world does precisely that. It diminishes the value as the money falls in value. Hence, ethically and morally, this is something which must be condemned. So, pay the laborer his wage before the sweat dries on his forehead means not only to pay him without delay, don't keep him waiting for his wage, but secondly, to pay him a wage which will not be constantly diminishing in value. When we use the money that Allah created, which is still in the Quran up to now, the dinar and the dirham. 
that money never lost value if you paid your wage in dinars 5,000 years ago and with that wage you could buy five sheep today 5,000 years later if you paid the same wage it could still buy the five sheep and so the money that we had the dinar and the dirham functioned successfully as money in storing value and the money that we keep that we now have which has come from a source that I'll introduce to you in a moment that money is haram in accordance with this verse of the Quran repeated three times in the Quran what was the verse wala do not cause bachs bachs to become little hmm? do not cause people's wealth people's properties people's wages to diminish in value where did this money come from? let us begin this talk this morning this afternoon with this verse of the Quran that I have repeated several times I have explained it several times I've translated it several times and yet for some strange and mysterious reason we get no response none zero from the world of Islamic scholarship I don't know why why will they not respond this is a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who have faith in Allah La tattakhidhu al-yahuda wal nasara awliya Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies and because we use the right methodology in studying the Quran, not the wrong methodology of taking a verse in isolation because we use the right methodology we know from the rest of the Quran that Allah could not possibly be referring to all Jews could not possibly be referring to all Christians, not at all well then if he's not referring to all Jews and all Christians which Jews which Christians is he referring to and the answer comes right in the words which follow meaning do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other who themselves ba'aduhum hum ba'aduhum awliya'uba who themselves are friends and allies of each other the Quran is anticipating a moment which is to come when a mysterious reconciliation will take place between some Christians and some Jews and when that reconciliation takes place then a Jewish Christian friendship and a Jewish Christian alliance will emerge in the world and the Quran is telling us, warning us that when that Jewish Christian friendship and alliance appears in the world you are prohibited from maintaining friendly ties with them you are prohibited from becoming their allies and if you do that if you defy Allah you defy the Quran and you maintain friendly ties with them and join in their alliance what is the price that you would pay the Quran answers whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance you now belong to them you have lost your Islam 
Surely Allah does not guide a people who are wicked Indicating that this Jewish Christian alliance Is going to be a wicked alliance Has that alliance emerged? Of course it has Of course it has It is a Zionist Christian Zionist Jewish alliance Which has bonded together Part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world this is Western Christianity, the Vatican huh? and the Church of England, but not Eastern Christianity, which was Byzantium yesterday. No, that the Quran refers to as room, room, and the leadership of Russia today is not room. No, the leadership of Russia today is not room, but Russia is room. Room is there in Russia. Indicating that tomorrow we're going to see some changes in Russia and you can see a Christian, Christian leadership emerging in Russia and Allah knows best. This verse of the Quran is today fulfilled in the world. And the money that we are now using for our business transactions has come from them. It is paper money paper currencies and electronic money it is bogus it is fraudulent it is haram and we don't need in today's lecture to go over that subject anymore because we've done it several times in our lectures on Islam and money and Islam and the international monetary system and the prohibition of riba we don't need to repeat it today And so, when you pay the laborer his wage and you pay him a wage in money which is bogus and fraudulent and haram <laughs> how can this be ethically acceptable? No! This is ethically repugnant. You must pay him the wage in money which is halal, not haram. And so we're moving forward now with business ethics in Islam every business transaction which uses paper money and uses electronic money as the medium of exchange is a haram transaction but we are using it we all are using it, all of us that does not mean that we should not condemn it because that's the first step on the way to getting out of this hole in which we are now located. The reason why this topic is so important about business ethics in Islam is because Islam has given to the world insofar as business is concerned something called a free and the fair market. What is a free and the fair market? It is not only a market in which money, money is halal money, gold and silver coins, money with intrinsic value, money which does not constantly lose its value. But more than that, a free and a fair market is a market in which you don't have thieves. No. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَلَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى That if you want to reap, you must plant. If you want to reap, you must plant. Hmm? So if you are reaping, without planting, you're stealing from somebody. That's not a fair market. And Islam is so insistent on a fair market that it has promulgated a law of punishment, or had, of cutting off the hand of the thief. That is a severe punishment cutting off the hand of a thief 
Why? Not, of course, if the thief steals a mango from your mango tree, we're not going to cut off his hand for that. No. It has to be something of a certain value, significant value, before we cut off your hand. Hmm? The reason why there is this severe punishment of cutting off the hand of the thief is because Islam is so absolutely insistent on the preservation of a fair market. If we were to enforce that law today, there will be lots of bankers without hands. <laughs> if we were to enforce that law today, central bank without, the hand, without a hand. If we were to enforce that, line, that law today, downtown Manhattan would be handless. Hmm? The financial centers in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in New York and London, will see lots of people losing their hands. Why? Because you're reaping without planting. You're stealing. You have a plan with which you attack a particular currency. And as the currency falls, you make a windfall. <laughs> Somebody's loss becomes your gain. That's nasty. That's repugnant. That my gain should be your loss. That's not business. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about business. He says in the Quran, riba." And Allah has made business halal and He has made riba haram. Why is riba haram? And today the market is saturated with riba. Hmm? Because in a riba transaction there is no risk. No, you are lending money and you are immunized from loss. You're going to get back your capital with the interest. That's not business. A business transaction is one in which you can either make a profit or you can suffer loss. And so a business transaction involves risk. The money lender does not want to embrace risk. And as a consequence of the market becoming saturated with riba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no longer, no longer will cause some to suffer loss and others to get gain and consequence of which money would circulate through the economy because he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you loss and give him gain but when money is lent on interest then the rich are immunized from loss and as a consequence the rich now remain permanently rich. The poor are now imprisoned in permanent poverty. The rich go richer and the poor go poorer. When the rich get their interest on their loan, they're doing so in a manner which is fraudulent because they're assuming no risk. And so they're sitting down home doing nothing, 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 no, maybe playing tennis in the backyard. And their money is working for them. <laughs> and they're becoming richer and richer and richer and richer. Allah says about them, وَأَكْلِهِمْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِلِ And they consume the wealth of mankind unlawfully. وَأَكْلِهِمْ and Allah has prepared a terrible punishment for such people. A market which is a fair market, therefore, is a market in which we prevent the thief <laughs> who comes and steals your cow from your backyard. 
but also a market which will prevent George Soros from coming and stealing 500 billion US dollars from Malaysia because he can attack the currency. Both are the same thing, stealing and for that the punishment is cutting off the hand of the thief. In order for the market to be a fair market we must insist on business and lending money on interest is not business. But in order for the market to be a fair market, a fair market means that no one should have any advantage over others in the market. You cannot say that because you are Malay that the government is going to give preferential treatment to the Malay over the others. That's not fair. In order for the market to be a fair market, it must be a market which does not discriminate against anyone or in favor of anyone. Because my father is the, the minister, I get the contract. That's not a fair market. Hmm? Anything which acts in this way to unjustly give you an advantage, to unjustly give you a gain or a profit to which you are not justly entitled. Nabi Muhammad called it riba. Riba. And so business ethics in Islam when it insists on a free and a fair market insists therefore on a market which does not discriminate in favor of anyone or against anyone. So can we enforce a business boycott of Israeli goods? Everybody will raise their hand and say yes. Let's boycott Israel. If I ask for hands to be raised today, everybody will raise their hands. Let's boycott Israeli goods. And since Denmark is doing what Denmark is doing, let us boycott Denmark goods, goods as well. So no butter from Denmark. Huh? <laughs> the question is, since Islam insists on a free and a fair market, is it permissible in Islam to use trade as a weapon? Can we as Muslims approve of what the UN Security Council does? Namely, you impose an economic boycott on a country. Have a seat. Join us. Are we allowed as Muslims to do what Ronald Reagan did <laughs> when he spoke of the Soviet Union as an evil empire? and impose an economic boycott on the Soviet Union. Can we do what the Security Council is now doing in imposing economic boycotts on Iran, on Korea? Hmm? So, if we had the time, we'll ask you to show your hands. Every Muslim will raise his hand and say, let us boycott Israeli goods. But the answer is no. Islam does not permit the use of trade as a weapon. No. <laughs> and it is time for us to teach our people the deed. We do not use trade as a weapon. Islam permits you to trade even with your enemies. But you may not trade in weapons of war with your enemies. Hmm? And so if a man who worships the one God 
he's selling mangoes in the market. And another man who worships a dozen gods and goddesses is also selling mangoes in the market. And this Englishman who says, I don't worship any god at all, that's most Englishmen like that today, and he's also selling mangoes in the market. You do not, you do not determine who you're going to buy your mangoes from based upon what are his beliefs. The market does not operate that way. No. It's not an old boys network. No. <laughs> you have to see the quality of the mangoes. You have to look at the price of the mangoes. And you have to make a business judgment. Business judgment. So that if one customer, one businessman here is selling the mangoes, and he's a Muslim. You don't go to the Muslim to buy the mangoes from him because he's a Muslim. No. <laughs> because if you set that example, I will buy only from the Muslim because he's my Muslim brother. Tomorrow he could be selling you shoddy goods and you are losing because the others who are not Muslims are selling good, good, good mangoes. Hmm? Number two, you're setting a bad example. It's not only that you are losing out, you're setting a bad example because the Christian will say, well I'll buy from the Christian. And the Jew will say, I'll buy from the Jew. And the Hindu will say, I'll buy from the Hindu. Huh? And the Chinese will say, I'll buy from the Chinese. And the Russian will say, I'll buy from the Russian. Where is the market? No, Islam wants to establish a market in where all of mankind can come, all. And the market does not discriminate bet between the one who is white and the one who is black. The one who is tall and the one who is short. The one who worships the one God and the one who worships the stone. No, you do your business transaction based upon the quality of the goods and the price of the goods and without consideration what are the beliefs of that man or to which old boys network he belongs. Hmm? In choosing to buy and sell in the market, we have yet another consideration. If the market is to be a free market, we're talking about a fair market so far, a free market. And Faris has to listen carefully now because has to fix the price for a car wash and fix the price for polish. Mm -hmm. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, impose price control because prices are too high. Well, they're too high in Yemen now. They're too high in so many parts of the world now. People are screaming because of prices now. They call it inflation. We say no, it's not inflation. It's thieves in the market. Because it's not the price of the good that's going up, you dum dum. It's the value of the money that's falling, you dum dum. Hmm? And as the money money falls in value, as the money falls in value, there's a massive transfer of wealth. A massive transfer of wealth from the unsuspecting innocent masses to that predatory elite. The man who should teach the subject is Malcolm X. He understood the subject better than any of us. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, impose price control because prices are too high. Imagine 
50 ringgits for one kilo of durian that's very high very good durian yeah. 50 ringgits for one kilo of durian how can we eat durian impose price control fix the price every government is doing that in the world today every government is doing that in the world today they not only fix prices they fix wages and they call it minimum wage legislation they say we are the people of the free market and yet without any shame without any shame they impose price control on wages and yet say we are the free market <laughs> but Islam says free market and Islam says no price control no wage control not not the Prophet said no and we are accustomed if you ask the messenger of Allah for something and he says no that's it you will accept his answer hmm? but this man came back to the Prophet a second time O oh, messenger of Allah prices are too high impose price control for a second time the Prophet said no and then extraordinarily the man came back for a third time and for a third time the Prophet said no and so the hammer is hitting on our intellect three times the blow is hit that there is no price control in Islam and there is no wage control in Islam but the governments that rule over us know absolutely nothing about Islam and the scholars who are teaching them and advising them and guiding them are, are conspicuously silent on the issue the Prophet said we can pray to Allah and ask him to bring down the prices how? Mm. prices are determined by demand and supply <coughs> if you can increase the supply plenty durians come into the market the price will go down from 50 ringgits you can go and you get Odang Mira for 14 ringgits hmm? one of the best durians in the market now Odang Mira hmm. so there is no price control in Islam and there is no control of wages in Islam well then is Faris permitted to charge any price he wants to charge for a car wash since there are no price control none the market is a free market the question is is Faris permitted to charge any price he wants to charge for a car wash the answer is that Islam has given the ethical norm of a business transaction and so long as Muslims held on to that ethical norm of a business transaction whoever we did business with always trusted us and when they trusted the businessman who was a Muslim they eventually accepted Islam and so this whole region of the world became Muslim because of Muslim businessmen and the way they did business what is that ethical norm of a business transaction given in the Quran لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراد منكم do not rip off each other rather says the Quran let business transactions be conducted in a manner which delivers mutual 
satisfaction. لا تأكل أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراد منكم. Don't rip off each other. Rather, conduct your business transactions. Fix your price in such a way that the transaction will deliver mutual satisfaction. The buyer and the seller both being satisfied. So you do not have the freedom to choose any price you want, however high it is. You have to choose a price which gives you a fair profit but also allows your customer to feel that he has paid a fair price for the work which has been done. And once that customer is satisfied that he's paid a fair price for a job which has been done to his satisfaction, that customer develops trust in you. And that customer will continuously come back to you to do business. You have a car wash and he leaves this residence in this area to go and live in a place called Shah Alam which is maybe one hour, two hours away and yet the man prefers to drive two hours to come here to have his car washed why? because he has developed trust in you Pakistan was created in the name of Islam. The Pakistanis are fond of saying Pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illallah. What is the meaning of Pakistan? La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. Unfortunately, the businessmen of Pakistan in their conduct of business relations with the rest of the world have set such an example, such a deplorable example, that very few people trust them now with business. Hmm? This is how far, this is how far we have fallen as a community of Muslims in upholding the ethics of business in Islam. Let us now turn to money and how it is used. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam was passing by the mountain of Ohad with a companion, both of them on the camels. And he pointed to the mountain and he said to his companion, if this entire mountain were to be transformed into gold, and give them to me. Nothing will remain of it with me. After three days, nothing will remain except a dinar that I'd keep to pay a debt. Meaning, the Prophet and Islam does not want you to sit on your money. Keep it underneath your pillow. No. Rather the money should be brought into the market. Put to work in the market. Hmm? One of the good things about the stock market that was developed in the western world is that it took people's savings and brought it into the market so that the money could work in the market. We have the same system of their stock market, but we call it Mudaraba, Mudaraba, where I invest in your business, but I do not participate in the running of the business. Some people call it a sleeping partnership. And so it is commendable, it is pleasing to Allah that you take the money that you have in savings and invest it in the market 
because as you invest the money in the market jobs are created many people can now share in the profits that accrue from the different downstream uh, 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 activities that take place when you invest in the market let us turn now to one last topic when someone dies then in Islam the body is washed and then the body is clothed for the funeral and that is called a janazah and then the prayer which is performed over the janazah is called Salatul Janaza. So a Janaza was brought to the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam for him to perform the Salatul Janaza over the body. He asked, Did he leave any debts? They said no. So he prayed over the body, performed the Salatul Janaza. And then a second Janaza was brought for him to perform the Salatul Janaza. And he asked, Did he leave any debts? And they said yes, meaning he died leaving a debt behind with an estate which could not pay the debt. The Prophet refused to perform the prayer over this body. He said to his companions, you pray over your brother. But he refused. Mm. Abu Qatada al-Ansari, who was a companion of the Prophet then came forward and said, O Messenger of Allah, I will pay the debt. And then the Prophet performed the Salat al Janaza over that body. And so, to enter into debt is something of grave consequences. And to die with a debt and without leaving the money behind to pay that debt is so bad that the Prophet would not pray over your body. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, if I were to die on the battlefield, fighting against those who are invading my land, I'm from Afghanistan, what do Americans need in Afghanistan? We never attack America. Are you nuts? Huh? We're the poorest country in the world. The poorest in the world. You are the richest in the world. We never attack you. What are 200,000 American troops doing in Afghanistan? Huh? So he is on the battlefield fighting against the aggressor who is occupying his land and oppressing his people. It's called jihad. Jihad is never aggression. No, jihad is never aggression. It's always a just war. O Messenger of Allah, if I were to die on the battlefield of jihad, while advancing towards the enemy fellow from Brooklyn <laughs> he wants to get a green card so he joined the US Armed Forces and he's in Afghanistan <laughs> because he wants a green card while advancing towards the enemy not retreating and I were to die would I enter into heaven the prophet said yes the prophet said yes the man then turned to leave. The Prophet called him back, come back. You will enter into heaven on the condition that you die without leaving a debt behind. Here is Gabriel and he has come to bring that news. Because from the time the Prophet answered the man, Allah sent Gabriel, Dibra'il hmm? And so, 
we do not enter into debt lightly. The United States of America was like that once upon a time. People used to conduct business in such a way in the United States where they will always try not to be in debt. And a successful business was a business without any debts. From father to son to grandson, the business would be built up without debts. My mother, when my father died, my mother had five little children and she had to struggle to maintain us, we were orphans. And sometimes there was no food in the house. And so she would ask me, Imran, go to auntie and ask her whether she can lend me a hundred dollars. So I would take the taxi, pay one dollar, I think, go to auntie's home and ask auntie whether you could lend my mother a hundred dollars. And then I would return with the hundred dollars and give it to my mother. But I noticed that once my mother had borrowed that hundred dollars, she had difficulty in digesting her food. She is in a state of internal anxiety because she has a debt and until she pays that debt she's not going to be at peace. Where has that fled today? Huh? Now don't get angry with me. I only have a job to do, that's all. Don't get angry with me. Where has that anxiety fled? Where has that fear of debt fled today? Where you can go to a bank and sign a document. <laughs> For 10 years of debt and 20 years of debt. And 30 years of debt. Huh? And now, even worse than that. Only fools use their own money to do business. No, you should go and borrow the money and use the borrowed money to do the business and pay the interest on the money. Hmm? And so today we have a world in which everybody in debt and every business in debt. You have to borrow. So I wanted to rent an apartment in New Jersey. And one of the conditions for rental was to have, you have to give them your credit history. So they checked out my credit history and they called me in and they said to me, Mr. Hussein, you do not exist. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? Here am I, I'm in flesh and blood, I'm breathing. Mr. Hussein, you do not exist because you have absolutely no credit history. You're not supposed to be in the United States and never borrow. You see? This is how, this is how, we in following the American Sunnah, <laughs> we have lost our business ethics of never entering into debt unless and until we cannot avoid it. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam met his companion Jabir bin Abdullah in the masjid. He said, Jabir, perform two rakat salat, nafil. And after Jabir had performed the two rakat salat, the Prophet paid him a debt that he borrowed from him. So yes, it's permissible to borrow money. Permissible. Even the Prophet would borrow. But you must pay, repay the money. And after repaying the money to Jabir, suppose he borrowed a hundred dollars, no sorry, a hundred dinars. He repaid a hundred dinars and then he added two or three dinars more. Was this riba? Was this usury? No, it was not. Why? 
Number one, it was not a condition of the loan. <laughs> it was not a condition of the loan. No. The condition of the loan is, I'm lending you a hundred dinars, you repay me a hundred dinars. And so this was given voluntarily. Number two, it was not given during the duration of the loan. It was given after the loan was paid. And therefore this is not riba. We have now come to a world in which the market is so upside down, so corrupted, that business transactions are now very strange. The norm of a business transaction in Islam was always a cash transaction. You buy cash, you sell cash. Go try sell your goods to Macy's. Macy's is a big, big department store in the United States. If you want to go and sell something to Macy's, huh? They will tell you, we'll buy your goods from you, but we need 180 days to pay. Huh? So you have to wait 180 days. And if you do not, somebody else will come forward. And you lose the business. The prophet said, if you have a debt, and you have the means to pay the debt, and you delay in paying the debt, then that is wickedness, that is vulu. Hmm? So if you have a debt and you have the means to pay the debt, you must not delay in paying the debt. So we end now advising Faris with his car wash business to pay the laborer his wage before the sweat dies on his, dries on his forehead. Faris go look for dirhams and pay the wage in dirhams, silver dirhams. Hmm? Faris, when you set, set your prices <laughs> for a car wash or for polish, you fix prices where you will get a fair return on your labor and your customer will be pleased and accept that he's gotten the car wash for a fair price. Do not run your business on the basis of borrowing money. Do not enter into debt because a business without debt is a sounder, stronger business than a business that is run with debt. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless this business and grant it be a source of halal livelihood for Brother Faris and Sister Maysala. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami al-alim. Wa tuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya akham rahimin. Ameen. You probably have lots and lots of questions. Yes, Habil. Habil is from Egypt. Wa alaykum salam. Right. You can only sell that which you own. If it turns out that you did not own the mango, then the law would declare that it's an invalid sale and you return the mango and he'll have to return the money. And if it is a sufficiently large quantity of mangoes, okay, like the investment banker in Manhattan, you cut off his hand. But if it's only one mango, you're not going to cut off his hand for one mango. So the law is, in order for the transaction to be valid, you must be the owner of the goods that you're selling. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, as a Muslim, we are allowed to invest in, like, in Rabah. 
Mugdan Rabbah. But I remember there's a case. Professor, the best food they eat is the one that you get with your own hand. Yeah. So if we invest money and somebody else do the job for us, then this hadith is not Okay. You cannot reap unless you plant. One way of planting is to take a an instrument and plow the soil <laughs> and plant the seed. Mm. But a businessman does it differently. When a businessman enters into the market and invests his, bis his money in the business, he has to use his business acumen. Number one, to judge the profitability of the business. Number two, to judge the character of the owner of the business. And number three, to judge his business experience. Hmm? So you are not simply reaping without planting. You are taking critical business decisions which require some amount of research, some amount of effort on your part. So it's not correct to say you say please stay home and doing nothing and your money is booking for you. Yes. The question is, is it permissible for a government to regulate markets in order to preserve the health of the environment? Of course, because it is haram to pollute the environment. You have to show respect for what Allah has created. So a government can impose laws which restrict such businesses that would harm the environment. Okay? But imposing wage control, which is called minimum wage legislation, the reason why they're doing that is because as the value of money falls, the laborer is moving towards slave labor. <laughs> Did you hear that? As the value of money falls, the laborer moves more and more in the direction of slave labor. He's already reached slave labor in Haiti. He's already reached slave labor in Indonesia. Uh -huh. He's already reached slave labor in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in much of Africa today. He's already reached slave labor. As the value of money falls, the laborer is moving more and more in the direction of slave labor. But when it becomes too clear that this is slave labor, it brings about a certain embarrassment. The reason why they demolished or dismantled apartheid in South Africa is because it was too embarrassing for them. Not that they had any moral qualms about apartheid. No, these people have no morality. They don't worship any god. <laughs> no, the people who control power I'm talking about, not the ordinary American. They dismantled apartheid in South Africa because it was becoming too great an embarrassment from them. They dismantled Western slavery. The enslavement of the African people and putting them to work as slaves in the United States, in South America, in the Caribbean. Because slavery was becoming too great an embarrassment for them, not because it was morally reprehensible. No. Similarly with minimum wage legislation, as people's wages lose value, and they move more and more in the direction of slavery, slave wages, Number one, it becomes more and more of an embarrassment for them. But number two, it, it, all, it now opens the possibility that the lid will fly off and the masses will rise up in violent rebellion. Slave master doesn't want that. The slave master wants the slaves to continue to working, to work docile. Hmm? So what he does is to impose minimum wage legislation that will keep the cover on 
and Allah avoid violent rebellions. But in Islam there is no minimum wage legislation. And there's no need for it. Why? Because we don't use bogus money. We use gold and silver as money. Any more questions? If we buy goods from Israel, we will be contributing to the oppression of the Palestinian people. No, we do not conduct business this way. But if I sell my goods to you, you'll use the profits from the goods to oppress people. <laughs> a business transaction is a halal business transaction so long as all the conditions of the transaction are met. How you use that money is not my concern. No. If you're using that money in a wrong way to oppress people, then it is the function of the Khalifa and Darul Islam to ensure that there is no oppression anywhere on the face of Allah's earth. So long as we had the khal Khilafah and we had Darul Islam, they respected us. But when they broke us up into bits and pieces, eh, that was the strategy. Destroy the Khilafah so you could break up the world of Islam into small bits and pieces. You could then kick them around like a football. Football. Nobody respects you now. But the day you return to one united world of Islam, under one Khalifa, then they respect you. Because then you will not tolerate oppression anywhere on the face of Allah. Sir. Any more questions? Or is it time for Tetarik? Yeah. Uh, let, let, let's get some first. Yeah. If you have debts in a business, if you start a business with no debts in it, uh huh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is there any business that I can start without debts? No, any business without debts. Yes, it is possible to start a business without debts. Once you have, once you have some money, you could use that money to buy an axe and go in the forest and cut the wood and make bundles go to the market and sell the bundles of wood the daughter of Prophet Muhammad she and her husband Ali they did this they went to the jungle they cut the wood they made bundles they brought it to the market they sold without entering into debt so yes it is possible however if you want to do a business and you do not have enough capital. I said that I commended the Western stock market for this principle. That you can get people who have capital and who are not using their capital to put it to work. By bringing it into your business and investing in your business. They call it stocks and shares. Hmm? And when your business makes a profit they will get a share of the profit. But if the business suffers a loss, they will share in the loss. So in this way, you can do your business without having sufficient capital by attracting capital from those who have the capital to invest. This is called Modaraba. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. 
Now, if a man takes money from his own pocket in Islam, that is not considered a debt. If a man takes money from his own pocket in Islam, that is not considered a debt. In order for it to be considered a debt, you have to take it from someone else. Alright? Islam. So if you are starting your business with your own capital, then you are starting your business without any debt. Yeah. Is that all or do we have any more questions? Yes. In Malaysia we have a so-called unit trust. And also there is Islamic unit trust as well. But the problem is when the money invested in somewhere else, we don't know how that person, they are etiquette. So then they are profit, even though they are reading people off, that is Right. This is the this is the deficiency in the Western stock market system. The question is, if I invest my money in a business, I am not running the business. This is Mudaraba, sleeping partnership. But that business is not operating halal. That business is involved in haram things, prohibited things then that investment would be a haram investment. Today we live in a world in which if you have a business which is operating completely halal, then that business belongs to an endangered species. Those who rule the world will come and destroy it. Because you're not supposed to have a business which is free from haram. Hmm? The only place now where you can survive with businesses which are completely halal is if you get out of the cities get out of the cities and go to the countryside and in the countryside you'll be safer and you have more chances of operating a business that will be completely free from haram okay I thank you very much for your participation in this uh, topic I have by no means covered the subject but I do believe that we touched on some very important parts of the subject. And the last word I'll have to leave with you is this. That if you die with a debt, you know, the borrow, borrow the money, on 40 years you will repay the money. <laughs> if you die with a debt, and without leaving an estate that could pay off the debt, the Nabi Muhammad would not perform the Salatul Janaza over your body. And when you help a brother Muslim to pay his debt, then that is something that brings great reward. For Allah can then cover your sins and Allah can forgive your sins. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samir alim wa taba alina ya mawlana inna ka inta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamma rahmin amin. Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkaulah lah pengam-